Congratulations. Your much anticipated second novel, Orkney, is as rich a read as your first book, The Still Point, which won which was shortlisted for many awards and it won the John Llewellyn Rees Prize. And it was um hailed by the judges as a writer of seemingly limitless promise. <laughs> Not much pressure then <laughs> when it came to writing Orkney. Mm. Uh, yeah, you could say that. <laughs> uh, it was very difficult to write a second book, but I decided I wanted to do something quite different and distinct from the first book. So where the still point is quite broad in scope and has a sort of roaming third person narrator, the second Orkney is narrated in the first person by a professor of literature called Richard, who has married his ex-student um, and they've gone on honeymoon to a remote island off the north coast of Scotland and it tells that story within the scope of 10 days and in a very limited place and time. Yes and I and yet I find that you're doing something much more complex here with Orkney. What begins as a familiar almost fairy tale like narrative um, ends up as something fragmented, um, unsettling and odd, a kind of blurring if you like. For me, my starting point as a writer is sort of voice, style and form. Um, and once I've worked out those elements, then I know what it is I'm trying to do. And it, it's not just a case of imposing a particular experiment on the top of something, it's absolutely integral to the meaning. Um, and. and the, the impact that I'm trying to create. So in the case of Orkney, I mentioned the idea of there being a sort of cyclical structure. It's set over 10 days and we each day has a fairly similar structure um, and there are kind of repeated rhythms. And I think it's to do with, that's how I read, that's what stays with me when I, when I read something is, is the kind of rhythm of the prose and the texture of the book more than plot which I have an absolutely terrible memory for. I never remember the story of anything I read. I would give you a sense of that because of the landscape, because mm. of the way the weather changes and the way the sea changes. Mm. That was really quite something. It really pulled me in as, as a reader. Mm. Was that is that something was that quite deliberate? Is that how you use like to use the kind of changing landscape? Yeah, I like the idea that the sea would dictate the rhythm of the book on the level of the sentence, so there are kind of particular rhythms and, and repetitions within the, on the sentence level, on the level of each individual chapter. Um, the, the way that the book is structured is in quite sort of short chunks that are separated by space on the page and as the book goes on that space on the page becomes increasingly significant um, and again that relates back to this idea of, of presence and absence being what informs the whole structure of the book um, and the, the meaning of the book essentially so um, the idea that the, the woman is a sort of absence at the center of the book um, that Richard is constantly trying to write on to but that and she's constantly sort of eluding him um, and the idea of language always denoting an absence so she is never physically present when the narration is happening and the language is very beautiful uh, for me and for all the judges, actually. Mm. It, it was refreshing to find such um, literary boldness, I mm. think. Um, and I also find it intriguing. I really couldn't put it down. Um, how did you settle on that kind of first person voice, a 60-something professor of literature? Mm. Um, I really kind of pulled against writing in the first person um, when I started and I kept thinking, I certainly feel more comfortable in the third person, I think. Um, but it was really important that it is from this extremely kind of limited perspective and that he can't understand. We're absolutely restricted to what he can perceive. Um, I think I liked the idea of... I'm, I'm kind of interested in clichés, I suppose, and, and the idea of subverting a cliché. And so the idea of a professor marries his student is a sort of a bit of a standard trope, if you like, um, and I kind of wanted to turn that on its head. So he starts out extremely self-assured, um, very kind of, I, I suppose, bombastic, if you like. Um, so I really, I wanted to tread a line that I, that I hope it is 
lyrical, but it is also deliberately kind of overblown in places. Um, and I kind of wanted that voice to be uh, unsettled as, as the narrative progresses. And was there a particular inspiration for the book? I mean, what inspired you to write? Um, all kinds of different things. It's always difficult to look back at the beginning of uh, the genesis of a book and think, well, where did that come from? Um, the islands themselves was, was certainly one of the starting points. And the reason the book is called Orkney is purely because I couldn't think of another title and that's what the file name on my computer was. <laughs> so that's how it was sent to my agent and the editor and, and they were all calling it Orkney and I said, oh, that's not actually the, oh no, okay, that's and the actually, title. I think it's <laughs> the most compelling character in the book mm. um, is, is the setting. It's, I think it's hugely informed by the remote, it's remote brooding mm. and ever-changing landscape. Mm. Um, so what is it that kind of draws you to the wild, far-flung, um, freezing landscape? <laughs> and what is your relationship with Orkney? Um, I have no personal relationship with the place. Um, but I think I'm interested in islands and I'm interested in places that are kind of on the border of things. Um, so Orkney is an absolutely fascinating place, kind of historically, archaeologically. Um, culturally um, it sort of sits between a Scots and a Norse tradition that has this incredible kind of um, folklore tradition um, there are all these kind of layers of different civilizations that have been there and then kind of left traces and and vanished and so that idea of kind of vanishing and absence is is absolutely central to the book um, and similarly that idea of kind of meeting places and and a kind of overlayering of, of meaning and interpretation um, and, and interchangeability. So as you say, it's ever ever changing landscape that the, the sea and the sky and the, the land kind of merge into each other. How have people responded to Orkney? It was published um, in February, I think. Mm. Yeah. What's been the response like so far? Um, sort of mixed in a way that I, I expected, I think. I think I wanted to take a risk in a way and I think if, if you're looking for a kind of piece of psychological realism then that's that's not what it is and I think um, I think I really want to kind of work with form and kind of push the boundaries of what you can do with the novel form and keep trying to find a new way to use it so inevitably that's going to lose some people but it's going to interest others and there's been some lovely reviews and some lovely um, letters from people. I had a, a lovely email from a woman who lives in Orkney and is from Orkney and said um, it, it sort of really struck a chord with her which I'm very glad about because I only went there for sort of a week. And how does it feel to have been uh, shortlisted for the Fiction Uncovered promotion? It's a huge honour to be recognised in that way and I think the Fiction Uncovered promotion is particularly an interesting one because it just it's such a kind of illustration of how exciting UK fiction is at the moment I think and, and um, the, the sort of diversity of the list is really fabulous. Well congratulations once again. What's Thank next you. for you? Um, I'm working on a third book very slowly. <laughs> it is uh, set in Madrid, actually. Well, it's set in a kind of fictionalised historical Madrid. Um, so it's look. It's sort of using a court painter as the sort of lens through which the story is told. I think I want to push it in quite a different direction. So very much experimenting with voice but because there will be these sort of multiple levels so it's set in a royal court so and it will move through all of the levels of that court um, and I'm probably going back in some ways to the third person that I used in the still point and the kind of facility that that gives you to move into different consciousnesses but perhaps pushing that actually slightly further so that there will be sections which are much more experimental. I'm really sort of interested in kind of the literature of this 17th century kind of period and, and this sort of feeling of dissolution and, and degradation and, and kind of 
all those sort of plays like in, in, in English literature, like The Changeling and all the Middleton and Duchess of Malfi, all of those plays that have this kind of really weird, dark, labyrinthine sort of texture to them. So I'm kind of interested in trying to replicate that 